said, Mr. Uh, Professor Antoine, I give you the floor. Thank you very much. So thanks uh, for the invitation. It's great uh, to be here with you this afternoon. I see lots of people and names whom I know very well, but I don't think I've ever met you. So it's good to finally have an opportunity to chat. Um, so yes, uh, I'm going to talk about a recent paper I just published uh, entitled Philosophies of Migration uh, Governance. Um, I'm going to share my screen, even though I have a very short PowerPoint representation. Zoom seminars are already quite demanding, but you know, Zoom PowerPoints are even perhaps more demanding, so I'm not going to have too many slides. Uh, but nevertheless, I will just show one or two uh, slides and one or two web pages to illustrate some of the points uh, I will be uh, making. So let me turn, let me share the screen straight away. Um, okay, so just perhaps that you know, in case you're interested and you want to know more about the topic we will be discussing, this is largely, this presentation is largely based on a paper I published in a journal called Globalizations. Uh, I'm happy to share uh, the off print of the PDF with uh, those of you who might be uh, interested. Uh, but that's just the background uh, information in case some of you want to go further into the discussion we just uh, we, we're going we're going to have so uh, let me oh no I, I've lost the, 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 the sorry I don't know what happened it's always uh, yeah. there we go okay um, so here um, Yes, okay, that's my point, point because of migration governance. So perhaps two key points just to start with. Um, the first perhaps starting point of this, this paper when I started to write about it uh, was the very basic and very simple observation uh, that almost you know, all actors, observers, politicians, policymakers, citizens uh, tend to agree that there's something wrong with the governance uh, of migration, or at least that the governance of migration could be improved or should be improved or should be changed and so on. But there's absolutely no agreement on what exactly could be changed, how it could be changed, how it could be uh, improved. So basically, we have a odd situation in which we have, on the one hand, uh, global disagreement over migration or global insatisfaction with migration governance, and on the other hand, global disagreement over what you know, good migration governance uh, should uh, look like. So that was a starting point of the paper because I thought I should try to outline the different ways in which uh, this desirable or this satisfactory model of global migration governance or simply migration governance uh, could be uh, thought of and could be envisaged. And therefore I came up with this idea that, that we could identify five key philosophies of migration governance as I decided uh, to call them um, in the paper. So philosophies of migration governance are very broad conceptions of what ideal desirable, satisfactory uh, governance patterns uh, should look like. And different actors may, of course, have different preferences along different, those different uh, philosophies of migration governance. So it's a kind of open uh, question. We have, on the one hand, dissatisfaction with, but then I assume that from this dissatisfaction, people, uh, observers, policymakers, whomever, can sort of venture into at least five different uh, directions, which correspond to the five um, philosophies of migration governance I, I have uh, outlined. Uh, can you hear me without any problem? I'm being told by my computer that my connection is, is unstable. So anyway, let me know in case uh, it's, uh, it's not working. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was the first point. And uh, the second point, uh, the second key uh, starting point of the paper, was what I felt was a bit disappointing and uh, useless debates in the field of global migration governance. Uh, lots of observers, lots of practitioners also um, tend to have what I would qualify, what I would call binary or useless or fruitless oppositions, binary oppositions between different uh, models. Uh, very simple dichotomies uh, that seem to pervade the debate, both scholarly debates and policy uh, debates. Uh, for example, we have lots of people who oppose, on the one hand, sovereignty, the nation state, national immigration policy. 
on the one hand, and on the other hand, global migration governance. So we would have a choice, so to say, between a national venue and a global uh, venue. And we have a position between sort of nationalist and globalist uh, in terms of how to govern uh, migration. Very simple, but not very uh, perhaps fruitful uh, position between those two levels. We have a standard also a position in the literature between on the one hand, those who call who call for rights-based, as they call it, governance of migration centered on human rights, and those who rather advocate what is often called a management approach, a governance approach um, to, uh, to immigration uh, policy. And you have countless papers and countless positions, for example, also between NGOs and uh, policymakers on you know, a rights-based approach versus a management approach uh, to migration. And then, of course, we've got the standard migrant refugee opposition that even though everybody tends to agree that it's no longer relevant, nevertheless still pervades most of the debates. So uh, there were all these binary positions which I felt were needed to be overcome. And um, I actually used a long time ago to study uh, anthropology. So I remembered you know, this, this, this concept, uh, which is used by Claude uh, Lévi-Strauss, the concept of bricolage. Uh, of course, I'm not going to venture into a class about you know, structuralist anthropology. I really forgot most of it. Um, but still, there are a few interesting points. There's this idea uh, that uh, we, the way we think, uh, the way people and the way societies think, uh, is actually relies on a very small number of what you know, Levi Strauss would call elementary structures. So there's very basic units, uh, structures, and then you, we, we do bricolage, that is to say, we mix all those different elementary structures together to produce very sophisticated uh, ways of thinking or ways of uh, behaving. So bricolage is really about this. Uh, on the one hand, you, you need to identify the basic elements of the structure, uh, what I would call the philosophies of migration governance. And then rather than opposing them and say we have to do this or we have to do that and we cannot do both, you have to assume that states, societies, policymakers, um, different actors involved in migration governance, NGOs, and so on, sort of pick up from these different elements, bring them together in somewhat creative ways, and come up with all different different kinds of bricolage, you know, which can be quite complex because you take those different uh, basic philosophies of migration governance. You bring them together and you take a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and you come up with a fairly original um, and you know, lots of different ways to govern uh, migration. Uh, so my idea in a kind of levi Straussian perspective was to understand the basic structure, the elementary structure of migration governance, and therefore to identify those five philosophies, which could be understood as very simple patterns of migration governance, which are then brought together, mixed uh, in a bricolage fashion um, to, um, to, 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 to constitute uh, migration uh, governance. So perhaps just to, to clarify, I speak of governance rather than policy or politics um, in a very, I mean, I'm not going to enter into this complex debate, but basically governance to me is largely, I mean, not only to me, but like to many people, Governance is basically a multi-actor and a multi-level process. That is to say that the state is not the only actor. You have different uh, actors, NGO, employers, uh, private sector, states, and you have different levels from you know, international norms or global trends like capitalism uh, to urban uh, dynamics, local dynamics, uh, and so on. So I understand the governance as a multi-actor, multi-level uh, process which is why I speak of governance rather than uh, narrow uh, policy or policy making. Right, okay, so these are just two key ideas to explain why I uh, ventured into writing uh, this paper. And now I turn to the key points, which are those five uh, core um, philosophies of the governance, which I tried to identify. Um, I'm going to go through uh, all of them. Uh, one after uh, the other, just showing the key points. Um, they are not very complex, they're very easy to understand. So that, that's the point, it's not to have a complex uh, model, it's rather to identify very simple models, which then, on the other hand, you can bring together in complex ways. Uh, so the first is very simple. It corresponds to this idea uh, that migration is about people, it's about territory, 
and therefore it's absolutely central to sovereignty. We're all very familiar with this uh, idea, but it follows that the very uh, existence of the nation state is largely based about the control of migration. There are lots of historical work on how the two, like the, the, the emergence of nation states, went along the control of people or the invention of the passport, to quote the famous book from, from John Tope. Uh, so there are lots of less different perspectives uh, on this, this first philosophy of migration. But overall, it's quite uh, simple. It posits that um, there should be no migration governance in the sense that it should not be multi-level, it should only be state level, and it should not be multi-actor, it should be only the state who's in charge of uh, the admission and treatment of non-nationals, because this is at the heart of the constitution of the nation and of the state, and therefore it's a prerogative of governments. Uh, of course, it doesn't mean that you have closure. Uh, states can, in a sovereign way, decide to open up to certain flows of, of, of migrants, which should not confuse, as we tend to do sometimes, you know, sovereignty with uh, border control. The two are, are not exactly the same thing. Uh, you can, you know, sovereign, in a sovereign way, decide to admit certain types of migrants. That's pretty obvious, but still worth uh, recalling. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, this you know, makes it very difficult to cooperate uh, because this is a sovereign prerogative and therefore there's little uh, cooperation between states on immigration policy. Anyway, that's a very simple uh, model, um, documented from a historical perspective, and according to some would still be to large extent in this perspective, we can discuss this in the discussion, but there are quite a few people out there who believe that somehow, despite all the debates on global migration governance, we are still stuck, so to say, in this first philosophy of migration, in which migration is above all an issue for national sovereignty. Right, so then we turn to the uh, second philosophy, uh, which is perhaps the most complex one, just in, because it unfolds into two sub-philosophies, so to say. Uh, so I'm trying to explain as, you know, as, as, as clearly as possible the, how I, I have designed this, this second philosophy. Uh, I call it global anti-migrant uh, governance. Uh, so the point here is that uh, we do have cooperation, uh, but that this cooperation to some extent is implicit and is based on principles that may not be really uh, publicized. Um, so the first uh, manifestation is this, of this is what we all know very well, uh, what I call the global forced immobility governance, which is uh, a wide range of cooperation mechanisms to ensure, to put it simply, border control. Uh, of course, we have all remote control policies, externalization here, we, we all know about that. Uh, this is really global governance in the sense that you have cooperation between states, uh, you have uh, involvement of uh, non-state actors, for example, international organizations, like typically the International Organization for Migration, uh, is involved in this type of, of governance. You, you also have uh, NGOs to some extent, for example, development NGOs may be involved uh, in or anti-trafficking NGOs uh, may be involved in uh, this global forced immobility governance. So it's not simply about border control, but it's nevertheless a wide range of actors who tend to basically enforce, uh, enforce forced immobility. That is to say, to really incite or force uh, would-be migrants to stay uh, in their country. So I think we can talk about uh, a pattern of global governance, because again, we have a multi-level and a multi-actor uh, process here. Uh, on the other hand, um, it's kind of implicit governance, uh, because there's no real overarching principle. Um, there's no uh, sort of no high level government intergovernmental meeting that would say, well, let's you know, enforce uh, global immobility governance that does not exist. But from, you know, from the observation of patterns of cooperation between states or between states and IOs, or between states, IOs and NGOs, you can observe that indeed there's this you know, governance of forced uh, immobility, which is to a large extent the corresponds to a model of global governance. Um, so that's the first um, sub-philosophy of, of the second philosophy of, of, of governance. And the second one is what I call global labor exploitation governance. That again uh, is, I would say, a pattern of global governance that really is based on the exploitation of, of foreign labor, of migrant labor. This is why I tend to call both 
global forced immobility governance and global labor exploitation governance as part of a sort of total, which would be global anti-migrant uh, governance. Uh, basically, this labor exploitation governance can take different forms. It can be, you know, short-term um, temporary labor migration with, you know, less access to rights, less access to labor protection, and so on. Or it can be the tacit uh, tolerance towards irregular migration and the reliance on undeclared uh, labor provided by unskilled and um, irregular migrants, you know, throughout uh, industrial and developed uh, countries, and not only. So in that case, I think we also have governance because we have a kind of implicit agreement between states uh, to organize this. We have a tolerance towards illicit, uh, irregular, unauthorized mobility from one state to the other. Uh, and we have at least we have strong cooperation, implicit but strong cooperation with the private sector, obviously, which indeed is central in this, this organization of labor mobility and under exploitative um, conditions. So here, I think we do have another pattern of uh, global governance. And of course, uh, the two forced mobility and labor exploitation, uh, they seem to pursue different objectives, but no, it's very easy to see that they actually go hand in hand. Uh, they make for a very you know, a fragile uh, situation for migrants, in which migrants are both incited, you know, and both controlled and uh, exploited at the same time. And the two taken together is quite a robust uh, regime of anti-migrant uh, governance. Um, but of course, it's not an explicit regime uh, like the refugee regime. It's much more of an implicit regime. And the key issue, theoretically speaking here, is to what extent we can decide that this is governance. Uh, it is rather uh, implicit governance, the unpublicized uh, governance. Uh, can we nevertheless claim that it's governance or is it rather kind of a patchwork of ad hoc policies um, from different actors, that's open to question. But I would say that we have taken together here a very strong, robust uh, regime for uh, migration governance, which um, can be quite unsatisfactory because to a large extent, it is a global anti-migrant governance. It's based on control and exploitation. Of course, you could easily have, you know, um, Think about the historical genealogy of this of this governance pattern, because you know it does have its roots, of course, in colonial times, slavery, and so on. So there's a very old history of you know the, the role of forced uh, labor in capitalism and the role of control uh, borders, uh, police and security forces in the establishment of this this this, this, this global uh, economy and the need for the circulation of labor in this uh, global economy on on the long run. Of course, that's another uh, issue. I'm not going to venture into this historical um, dimension, but nevertheless, you can quite easily argue uh, that you have here uh, not only a robust pattern of government today, governance today, but you do have also a very old historical way of addressing um, labor mobility that really finds its roots uh, several centuries ago. Uh, so the third one uh, is rights-based migration governance. As I said, it's, it's something that we know quite well. It's often advocated by different actors, including certain international organizations or NGOs. And at first sight, it's very simple uh, because we do have indeed here a human rights regime, so to say, grounded international law. And as you all know, um, human rights are for everybody, including therefore migrants, even though the connection is not straightforward. But nevertheless, on paper at least, you could argue that this is a robust migration uh, governance pattern because it fits into uh, strong international human rights law. On the other hand, and I'm just going to briefly show here, uh, sorry, I'm going to show something else here. Um, uh, where is it? Um, Yep, there we are. Um, sorry, it always takes a little time to uh, switch from one screen to the other when you, when you do that. Um, yes, here. Uh, that's, you no, know, you probably all know this, uh, but it's uh, from the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, the status of ratification of uh, the International Convention on the Human Rights of Migrants on the Rights of Migrant Workers and Members of Family uh, to be complete. Um, and you probably all know this convention, you probably also all known that it was 
only ratified by a handful of mostly uh, sending uh, countries. The map here is very uh, explicit. So that's perhaps you know, the, 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 what, what, you know, the main obstacle to this third sort of rights-based uh, migration uh, governance is the observation that, um, well, on the one hand, it's very solid, it's very robust. We do have international law basis for that. On the other hand, in practice, uh, it has you no know, gone. In, it has bumped into uh, major and deep uh, problems in terms of implementation, in terms of political uh, will. So this is quite uh, clear. On the other hand, uh, we can speak about a govern governance pattern here or about a regime, because we do have standards. We do have international law uh, standards. It's an old. Uh, pattern of governance as well. You can trace it back historically all the way back to the ILO uh, century ago in 1919 that already was you know, concerned with the rights of migrant uh, workers. So it's not at all a new or recent uh, pattern of governance. It's a well-established one that you know, runs throughout the 20th century and up to until uh, today. Um, so it's, it's ground international law. It's old, it's quite robust, but it faces major uh, political uh, obstacles, as you can see from the ratification uh, status. Uh, let me just uh, briefly go back to my list of philosophies here. So this is for the third one, global rights-based migration uh, governance. Um, again, a uh, pattern of governance at first sight very robust, but on the other hand, uh, extremely fragile from a political perspective. Um, the fourth one um, is a, another philosophy of governance, uh, which basically is about migration management, to put it very simply, uh, which I define or would define in the most simplest form as a largely economistic approach uh, to migration or migration policy, premised upon the idea that the first and foremost migration should be economically useful. Uh, the so-called triple win objective it should be useful for sending countries. Uh, it should be useful for receiving countries and should be useful for migrants themselves who should earn more thanks to a regular uh, and safe uh, migration. Uh, so I've had criticism with this fourth philosophy uh, from some of the reviewer, for example, uh, argued that, well, we should not confuse migration management with the migration development agenda. Uh, these are two different things, and one of the re reviewers suggested that I would actually divide this, 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 this fourth philosophy of, of governance into, on the one hand, management, and on the other hand, migration and development. I tend to disagree. I tend that both um, actually pursue a very much economistic, again, uh, conception of migration, and both try to uh, shape migration flows and steer immigration policy on the basis of the usefulness of uh, uh, economic usefulness of uh, migration. Uh, so again, it's very much that's, that's, that's perhaps the easiest um, philosophy that you can connect to what is traditionally called the overall migration governance, because this is clearly the dominant philosophy in most of the uh, UN system today. Very obviously, the IOM played a key role in, you know, in promoting migration management and in you know, establishing this, this fourth philosophy uh, of governance. Uh, you also have you know, uh, sending states working on the migration development access. You have many different actors. And uh, quite typically, I think, again, I can share. Uh, sorry, again, I have to change, change the, the screen. Um, but I can you know, share this. Uh, where is it? Uh, now I have to move from one. Up. Yeah, this one here. You probably all know target 10.7 of the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, which is perhaps a quintessential you know, a definition of this fourth philosophy of uh, migration, which you know, is really about uh, well managed, um, orderly, safe uh, migration management. This, I think, is really uh, perhaps the, the most, the simplest expression of this thought philosophy. Uh, it sees uh, migration as a strategy for development by definition, and it's something that should be planned in a careful way in order to be as you know, economically beneficial as uh, possible for all uh, actors uh, involved. Um, so this is a fairly influential uh, migration governance philosophy today. Uh, 
probably, as I said, the dominant one uh, inside the, the, the UN uh, system and among many, many uh, policymakers and NGO people throughout uh, the world. Um, on the other hand, uh, you can discuss whether it's a really influential uh, philosophy. It seems to be discursively at the level of narratives uh, quite influential. In terms of practice, um, we can discuss um, probably in terms of practice. Let me again uh, go back to my PowerPoint. Uh, uh, in terms of practice, perhaps it's not as influential as some would like it uh, to be, but nevertheless, it's a very uh, coherent uh, body of thought about you know, how migration should be governed. Uh, quite persuasive. Lots of people you know, tend to see this as a sensible way of doing things. Uh, and therefore, indeed, uh, you can identify uh, quite a neat uh, governance pattern uh, here. And now the fifth one, um, the non-governance of migration, the basically free movement. Um, I call it non-governance uh, non in brackets because it tends to imply that uh, there's no such thing as migration governance because people would be free to move. It's not so simple, of course, you have to actually make up the policy that let people free to move. So it's not really an absence of governance, but nevertheless, it's a specific pattern of governance uh, based on you know, the, the, the free movement, um, either as a matter of you know, as a political principle, um, based in a kind, for example, in the EU and the EU citizenship, uh, or as a, a kind of you know, um, strategy towards growth and development, as in certain regions, uh, world regions, regional integration processes, uh, in which um, free movement is understood as a way of boosting growth competitivity uh, within inside uh, the region. So that's perhaps the last one, not perhaps the most influential one, even though, of course, uh, at certain regional levels, uh, it is very influential. But what is interesting, perhaps, with this one is that it can be developed at a regional level uh, in the EU, of course, but not only in the EU, in other regions also, that you can, you can find you know, symptoms of this, this non-governance of migration, free movement. But at the global level, it does not exist as a robust uh, pattern of governments except perhaps in the, in the heads of a small number of NGO and civil society groups that call for free movement at the world level, but who play really a marginal role in, in debates about uh, migration uh, governance. Okay, um, so I have now gone through those five uh, philosophies. Uh, perhaps just to sum up, I tried, I'm not very good at doing that, but I tried uh, to uh, make up a small sort of you know, table that would bring everything uh, together. Uh, so here on the left, you have the different uh, philosophies. Then you have the key principle. Uh, the assumption here is that governance uh, is as long as you, as you want people to cooperate on something, you need uh, explicit or implicit, implicit principles uh, that people should agree or actors, stakeholders should agree upon to, to work together. Uh, so, for example, with sovereignty, the key principle is security, state sovereignty, and so on. Um, for management, the key principle is this economic, economistic utilitarianism, uh, and so on. Um, and then here I have you know, the nature of the principle in the sense that in some cases the principle is explicit. Um, in some cases, I said, with, for example, forced mobility, the principle is you know, half implicit, half ex implicit in the sense that states not say that they want people to be immobile or they want to exploit people. They don't say so, but in practice, they behave in such a way. So the, the principle is implicit. And the question is, is this a policy principle? When it's hidden, it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a key question we can discuss. But nevertheless, I try to, you know, to, 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 to distinguish those philosophies according to their principle and also whether or not the, the, the key principle of the governance is explicit or if it's hidden and you have to deduce it from uh, the observation of the, of the, of the way actors uh, behave. Uh, then I have non-state actors that are involved, assuming, of course, again, then governance is a multi-actor uh, process. Uh, so I try to identify which non-state actors are involved assuming that if only the state is involved, like in the first one, it's not really uh, governance, it's more like, you know, policy making. Um, so, you know, different uh, non-state actors and the level at which uh, the governance takes place. Uh, mostly it's global, but the last one with free movement, as I said, is global, but also mainly perhaps uh, regional. 
Right. Okay. So these are the, the, the kind of overview of my five patterns of, of or philosophies of governance. And what perhaps uh, I think is useful with this model is that we can play with those uh, different philosophies. We can actually play just like you know you, you play Lego with your kids. You can take them and you know construct different buildings uh, with these different blocks. Uh, and in some cases, you can use those blocks as opposing each other. But you can also use them together, sort of bring them together in, to make one single um, um, policy. Uh, so, you know, to some extent, we have clear positions. Uh, for example, you know, the, the, the rights-based approach is clearly incompatible with uh, the exploitation of labor, uh, labor, migrant labor. That's clearly a, a position inside uh, the system. On the other hand, you could argue, for example, that the management approach uh, the fourth one is a kind of continuity of the forced mobility or the exploitation of the second philosophy. Uh, some people criticize migration management for being basically about control and labor uh, exploitation, simply made explicit and legal rather than implicit and sort of uh, uh, tolerated um, despite their unlawful uh, nature. So you can see kind of continuity between some of the philosophies of um, of governance, so you can play with them and uh, try to see for each you know, uh, situation which different principles uh, are playing uh, a role. Um, I see, I have a message. Uh, I guess so. I guess I have to um, have a few more minutes uh, to go. Um, thanks for the reminder. So you, know, you can play with those and construct and you know, check for every situation which are the key. Uh, principles that are at stake. And even at the most individual level, you can have people who go from one philosophy uh, to the other. Uh, obviously, you know, no, no, Brexit is a very clear reminder that the same people can go through different uh, philosophies of migration governance, moving from free movement, for example, uh, to uh, management or to sovereignty, depending upon how you analyze uh, the situation. So you can actually you know, uh, look at uh, the situation, assuming that you have no pure migration governance. That's perhaps the key point. Uh, perhaps I would conclude with this, with this observation. Uh, I don't think we'll ever have a kind of pure, coherent uh, body um, of, of, of migration policy. We will always have a patchwork of very different uh, policies applied to very different uh, people. Um, and so all the debates about uh, global migration governance tend to some extent to miss this point and to miss the, by definition, highly heterogeneous nature of immigration policy. Uh, and therefore, uh, to select certain aspects <coughs> to the detriment of others. And perhaps what I've tried to do in this presentation and the paper that supports the presentation is to uh, really use this concept of, of bricolage as an alternative uh, way of thinking about uh, immigration policy and migration governance as something that is structurally diverse, heterogeneous, and contradictory. And as you no know, state policy uh, governance mechanisms always building upon uh, contradictions, navigating between um, very different and opposing uh, principles, and always trying to sort of overcome uh, these internal uh, dilemmas. And you know that perhaps was the key point behind this 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 this. this tentative I had to, to, to identify those five patterns of, of, of migration um, governance. Right, so I think I'm approaching the end of my time. Uh, so thanks a lot for your, for your, for your attention. Um, I hope I've been you know, clear enough and have not spoken too quickly. It's always difficult when you speak towards your own screen. Uh, but you know, I'm happy to, to, to discuss further and to answer questions in some of the points where were not clear. And I will now uh, stop sharing my screen so that I can see you again. Thanks a lot for your presentation, for your, for your, for your for listening to my presentation. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Antoine. Um, yeah, I guess um, uh, whomever has a question, uh, you could go ahead and raise your hand or write your question in the in the box as well, in the chat box. I see Elaine. Hi. Uh, 
Um, I thought I'd turn my camera on so you can at least see a face. I, I can imagine it's quite strange speaking to all these black screens. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. I, I, I really enjoyed uh, listening to it. I really enjoyed the paper. Um, I want to actually uh, pick up on this uh, point um, that you mentioned about the separation of managerial and development, um, because I think I agree with the reviewer, but not their reasoning. Um, and I think actually separating out and having development as a separate one um, might also capture, I'll take a step back. I've got too many ideas going through my head at once, but so I would make a distinction between migration and development in a management context and migration and development in a broader context. And um, so I would argue that um, the way migration and development has been appropriated, if you look at, uh, for example, the work of Sutherland and the JFMD and all these types of processes, I would say that uh, it was almost that migration and development was, I think you described it as like this powerful narrative. It was something that could really, like it, people coming from these different perspectives. And I really like the idea of using bricolage to capture that. Um, everyone could kind of find themselves in it because, you know, development's not bad, right? And mm -hmm. this was a pillar of the UN system that, you know, this was a way to bring migration in uh, to the UN, in my view. So perhaps there is a rationale or argumentation for separating it out from that perspective and then seeing it still as the separate Lego block. Uh, mm -hmm. Because I do think you can also see, for example, many of the kind of human rights actors also talking about, you know, if you... Uh, fulfill uh, the rights of migrants, then uh, they will have individually at a human development level better development outcomes. So you, you can make an argument for, it's not quite the same argument that was presented, I think, from the reviewer, but I would still agree that maybe there's a rationale to separate it out. Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks a lot. Should I reply now or you want to take more questions? I think you can go ahead and reply because I don't see any other hands. Well, no, I, I completely see your point. I and mean, I agree, of course, with the strategic use of the migration and development nexus uh, by certain actors like typically Sutherland. Uh, indeed, um, on the other hand, I always felt that if you really wanted to anchor migration into UN uh, work, you could just as easily have selected human rights. You could have said, well, no, UN is about human rights, so why would, don't we put at the center migration and human rights? That would in principle, it would have worked quite easily. I mean, in, in terms of you know, finding a way of connecting migration to standard UN activities, that would have been very, um, very fine as well. Of course, it would have been more controversial, um, precisely because, you know, as I tried to say, the, the, the big reluctance, political reluctance towards you know, the connection between migration and human rights. Uh, on the other hand, it would have been feasible. So the fact of connecting this to development um, to me was a way of bringing in a kind of very much uh, sort of utilitarian logic. This is why I thought, well, we should connect this to migration management, which is entirely about uh, migration, uh, managing migration for in terms of very much a new you know, sort of new management, um, public management philosophy behind that. Uh, but I completely see uh, what you mean. And at some point, you have to make choices. And indeed, as I, I say in the discussion, you can always find gray zones between those philosophies. Um, I completely agree that you could perhaps connect differently. Um, I'm always a little skeptical about the people who try to connect development and human rights. Of course, I see the point of the human development approach and the fact that you can empower people through human rights to become actors of development. That, that's very robust. There's no, I have no problem uh, with that. On the other hand, I tend to... Um, I mean, consider that migration development nexus is really not about human rights. Uh, it's about finding uh, a convergence of interest between sending and receiving countries. Uh, so not really about human rights. And actually, people who think about this always tend to recommend, for example, short-term labor migration programs as a strategy to, to achieve the migration development nexus. And we all know that it's very bad in terms of labor rights, uh, respect for labor rights. Um, so I really tend to think that when people take the migration development philosophy seriously, they end up with proposals that are inevitably uh, have inevitable shortcomings in terms of, of human rights. Because I think there's no way you can bring the two uh, um, together. If you're really serious about protecting uh, human and labor rights, 
um, uh, migrants, then somehow you will you will not be able to, to achieve a standard migration development. For example, if you want migrants to return to the country with their skills to avoid brain drain, a typical policy concern, then somehow you have to monitor their mobility and somehow you have to reduce uh, their rights. Um, so I tend to think that fundamentally in terms of philosophies of governance, you cannot have both uh, human rights and development. Um, of course, you can have all kinds of theories that try to connect the two. But I would say that it's, it's a bit superficial. It's a bit of a construction, you know, trying to overcome the dilemma of two philosophies. That's precisely the way I would interpret it. And that's why I was stressing the fact that you have those different philosophies and that connecting them um, is part of the policymaker's job, for sure. But it's not, you know, it's, it's always good keeping in mind that the building blocks are quite different. And of course, you bricolage, you do bricolage with them, but the bricolage may, may be just that bricolage, not, not really a, a strong, robust uh, philosophy. <laughs> Do we have any more questions or any comments? Um, hi, may I? Of course, hi. go ahead. <laughs> So uh, hi, my name is Andrea Milan. I, I'm actually working for IAM. I'm sorry, I just realized I have this very institutional background, but uh, just from the last meeting. Uh, but I'm also a former uh, PhD student no in problem. Maastricht and speaking in personal capacity, right? I should say that. Um, I have a couple of, uh, of comments and um, they come from two experiences. One is I, I was in the um, office of the UN Special Representative for International Migration that, uh, so to say, supported the development of the Global Compact on Migration. And also I'm currently um, leading the project on the Migration Governance Indicators Project. It's a project with um, 84 countries and about 30 local authorities looking rather at national and local migration governance though. So I'm not so uh, well um, prepared on the global level. A couple of reflections. One is, uh, and this is my understanding of it. My sense is that when you speak about the development um, philosophy, as a student back then, I had uh, the strong feeling that way more than IOM, IOM being largely a humanitarian organization, although we also have, uh, but, but IOM's migration development work is really recent. I think that uh, that paradigm was developed, I agree with Elaine, to a large extent, there was the whole uh, Sutherland uh, group, etc. but also really the World Bank and especially the, the work called Dili Prata because in the 2000s, I think that when the World Bank started putting out some numbers showing that remittances were a huge contributor to, uh, to, to migration, I think there was a, 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 you know, I think in my opinion, more than IOM, it's been really the, the World Bank and some other development actors that really pushed that mm -hmm. philosophy, as you call it. But my um, my other reflection, a little bit more general, is uh, also like Helen. I do see that the, I mean th that distinction between managerial and, and development. I see a couple of issues. One is, in my opinion, this uh, managerial philosophy of migration is to a large extent driven by the first philosophy that you mentioned, meaning the sovereign uh, sovereignty approach. In the sense that, in my opinion, it's been driven by uh, member states. Uh, UN member states way more than from international organizations that, in my opinion, rather adapted to the context that they deal with. Because if you take IOM, IOM does not have a formal normative mandate like, say, UNHCR. Uh, so, of course, it works in a different uh, space and has less. Um, and the second element is one way in which I see management and, and uh, development as two separate issues. And I haven't seen what your reviewer exactly had in mind. But in my opinion, the managerial approach, um, again, is really like the, the centrality of the state, although formulated in a different way, but it really comes from there. When it comes to the development approach, there is also a strong, um, you know, national government drive there, uh, but it's not exclusive because if you look at, uh, I know you looked at global migration government, but if you look at the national level, for instance, you do see certain countries where development approaches tend to be more, more central, meaning, you know, the, say the points-based system countries that really want, um, you know, development out of migration processes. But there's also this, for instance, other countries that rather think that they are social cohesion or anyway. So for instance, they tend to favor family reunification rather than points-based system. So in my opinion, that, that philosophy, when you look at it, I mean, at it from, again, more national perspective, 
still, those two elements are different, and but but they do come from the national level, really driving that conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, having said that, uh, I found your presentation very very interesting, and I haven't read your paper, but I I look forward to. So thanks a lot for. for Thank you. Mm. Well, yes, uh, I see what you mean. Uh, on the other hand, I think well, it's. I remember a long time ago I organized a conference um, and we invite on migration management and we invited Bimal Ghosh. You may have heard about Bimal Ghosh, who was at, at some point, you know, a long time ago in the in the late 90s, one of the key thinkers of migration management, publishing this book, Managing Migration, I think in 2000, that's a really long time ago. And he recalled that, you know, he was one of the you know, sort of the you know, policy, policy entrepreneurs sort of pushing for this management approach. Um, and he recalled that at the time, it, in the 90s, it was like a dirty word among uh, governments uh, because governments said, well, we're not going to manage migration. We're going to control it full stop. This is our job. We have the right to do that. Uh, there's no such thing as managing migration. Um, so I would, I mean, I see what you point, I see your point. You can easily see that the first philosophy has today become quite difficult to maintain and it has sort of evolved into migration management as a kind of soft way or sort of multilateral way of talking about national sovereign prerogatives like, like control. This is quite uh, clear. On the other hand, this job has, was not done by states. Uh, I think you need people and organizations like typically the IOM that actually promote this approach and say, hey, we're going to take into account your interest as states and sovereign states, but we're going to do that in such a way that you can cooperate and this then you, you reach the second philosophy, which is about, you know, cooperation over control, um, which requires um, facilitators. You cannot cooperate without facilitators. And therefore, you need actually, you know, those in between actors uh, go between uh, that supports um, management or supports a kind of implicit sort of forced mobility um, uh, governance. So, yes, I, I see what you mean. That's why I keep stressing that those philosophies actually sort of, you know, Keep, you can keep moving from one uh, to the other. I just try to identify the very basic elementary structure here, but uh, I see uh, I see your point. And about the, the national uh, level, yes, I see your point, uh, social cohesion, uh, family unification. Uh, this, I would say, is uh, is basically the outcome of, well, you call it social inclusion, I would say that more it's more like a rights-based uh, philosophy, because fundamentally, you know, it's based on the human right to live with your family. Um, and that's what states are kind of obliged to do this um, no matter what even though it may be difficult in practice but you know uh, so yes uh, as your point on the other hand i tend to see that you know in most countries today the idea that migration should be beneficial for the economy is really a kind of overarching uh, idea and it's the key you know it's, it's the key idea that you find everywhere you know whether in the national the rhetoric but also in the like typically global compact rhetoric it's all about you know um, cooperation in order to ensure you know social cohesion, um, wealth, uh, development, growth, uh, and so on. So I, I see what you mean. Um, on the other hand, um, I would say states alone, that's why I speak of governance, states alone are not able to cooperate easily on migration. It's, it's a very messy field. You need you know, lots of different actors. You probably know this better than me being in the IOM, but it's, you, know, you need so many different actors and so many different levels to achieve uh, the uh, kind of transnational control or transnational governance of migration, that states alone cannot do that, and they need in between people. Um, and you know, from that perspective, I think it's, 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 it's still useful to distinguish between uh, very sort of sovereign uh, states in isolation from each other, from a governance approach, and from a forced immobility, anti-migrant uh, global uh, governance, which I you know you can actually move. Uh, I guess IOM would be in between the forced immobility and the, the management approach, the two sometimes are the two sides of the same of the same coin. Mm -hmm. Sorry, abusing to jump in. No, just to say that uh, I, I found what you said very interesting. And uh, the, uh, I mean, one other thing that I had in mind, but I forgot to mention earlier is one thing I find very interesting is that when it comes to the philosophies of migration, uh, of course, we speak about states at the general level, but especially if you look at the difference between the ministries for foreign affairs, vis-a-vis -vis especially the ministries for the interior. Uh, mm -hmm. For instance, the migration management, in my experience, tends to be very widely in the ministries for foreign affairs, while the sovereignty perspective can be more mm -hmm. from the interior. Anyway, this is all more from a national yeah. perspective. Yes. Anyway, your, your approach. No, I agree. States are, uh, I mean, states inhabit different uh, philosophies inside their own, of course. Yes, for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
May I also ask a question? Mm -hmm. Um, uh, thank you very much for this uh, fascinating um, and, and uh, quite stimulating presentation. I had a question about the fifth philosophy, uh, because in a way you break it down in, in two aspects. There's, there's an aspect of the political principle and the strategy uh, for development, growth. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and, and then you could also say that there's a human rights aspect though, uh, and that's the right to mobility. I, I know it's the right to, uh, to exit and not to enter, but mm -hmm. still there's a human rights, a universal basic human right there. Mm -hmm. um, so in a way you could say that the political principle is really about sovereignty. Mm -hmm. It's expanded, it's a EU citizen uh, rather mm -hmm. than a national citizen. There's a development aspect, which is utilitarian, mm -hmm. and there's a human rights aspect. So. Yes. Mm -hmm. Why would you separate it out as a different mm -hmm. philosophy when it indeed it can fit into these three other philosophies? Yes, yes, that's that's a good question indeed. Uh, I uh, also thought about this. Um, it's just that at some point, you know, I felt that um, you had to envisage a situation in which um, governance leads to a kind of non-governance, so to say. You decide that you don't want to interfere with people's uh, mobility. You want them to be, of course, it's, it's never as simple. You have lots of mechanisms to steer people's mobility, like, you know, the Erasmus program in Europe, for example. You actually try to have people move and, uh, you know, uh, incite them to do that and so on. Um, but uh, indeed, I think you, 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 you're right. The, the free movement philosophy is, is based, I, I would be a bit skeptical about human rights dimension. Uh, I think that if you talk to human rights people, uh, lawyers and practitioners, they tend to be very skeptical about the rights to mobility. That's a, it's a, it's a fancy concept we, we play with, but it's from a human rights perspective. I'm not sure many lawyers would take it really seriously, so I would be a bit skeptical about that. But I agree with you. I mean, it, it can the free movement can easily fit into the, 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 the development um, paradigm, um, or it can fit into uh, the sovereignty paradigm as a kind of new sovereignty, you know, as EU sovereignty or EU political body, political citizenship, um, and, and so on. On the other hand, you know, I, I felt that, you know, in the case of free movement, uh, you do have uh, what, what's characteristic is that at some point you, 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 you stop trying to closely monitor the mobility of people. And of course, it can be for many reasons, but at some point, this, this is what happens. So this is why I wanted to put it differently. Um, but I agree with you, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's very complex uh, and it does relate to other, to, and historically, if you look at the EU, at the beginning, the free movement was clearly a development, developmental strategy, for sure. Then it became more of a political strategy or human rights strategy or whatever. Uh, it can change you know, the narrative, the rhetoric, the justifications can change uh, over time. Um, but at some point when it exists, I would say that you know, all these concerns become somewhat secondary and it becomes a kind of non-governance of migration, even though, of course, it, it, it remains very tricky. We see in Europe every day, you know, these days, you know, that, that you can easily go back to, 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 to control for all kinds of reasons. Mm -hmm. But I uh, know, thanks for the question. Indeed, it's, it's a very relevant point. Uh, it's, it's not easy to, 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 to decide where to, where, to put, where to put it. But still, I felt that it deserved a kind of a philosophy in itself, also because it's very much, uh, you have lots of debates about the ethics of free movement, you have debates about NGOs calling for free movement, you have economists calling for free movement. So I thought they would, you know, it would deserve the kind of you know, uh, ad hoc uh, category, so to say. Mm -hmm. May I follow up with another question, maybe? Mm -hmm. Thank, thanks mm -hmm. a lot for this. Uh, so maybe I, I um, maybe I misunderstood something. Um, so what, what you're arguing is that already with these philo philosophies shape certain policies, but already we are seeing bricolage, right? Mm -hmm. We are already seeing that. Okay. So based on, on, on this, where do you see migration governance going? Mm -hmm. uh, based on the fact that, okay, we are already dipping our fingers in different places. Mm -hmm. And in a way, is it just that it's going to be a continuum on swinging this way and then this way and then this way? Or do you see new philosophies mm -hmm. uh, coming about? Uh, well, yes. Well, um, I mean, on the one hand, I, 
I would say that if you look at history of migration governments, uh, you do indeed have a continuous sort of borrowing from different uh, philosophies, and it's never a pure uh, philosophy, it's always sort of you no know, bricolage. Um, on the other hand, it's true also that there are new philosophies that emerge. For example, you no know, management did not exist a century ago, for example. You know, if you go back to the debates about migration governance at the time of you know, pre-World War II, ILO, and the uh, Treaty of Versailles, and so on. I mean, you did have, I mean, when you read the debates, there are something like management emerges, you know, but it's not quite clear. Um, and development is not really an issue because you still have, you know, colonial empires. So the very idea of development is, was not, was absent. Um, so I'm not, I mean, indeed, I, I think I would, I would need to really go into the history and show how these different philosophies have um, presented themselves in the past and how they may change in, in the future and whether or not we can have new uh, philosophies um, emerging. Um, honestly, I, I don't really know. I tend to think that at least in the foreseeable future, migration policy, migration governance will keep borrowing from those different philosophies for, for, for sure. Would a new one emerge? Um, I, I tend to think that perhaps it's a bit pretentious, but I tend to think that the different philosophies I have outlined capture most of what you can you can observe. Uh, but on the other hand, of course, you you, you know, you, um, we, we, um, I'm not here to, to foresee what and to predict what's going to happen. So I really don't know. It could well be that in 10, 15, 20 years time, I have to update the paper to, to include the new ways of thinking about uh, migration. On the other hand, I don't think these philosophies are really new. I try to sort of have very short historical dimension, but all of them tend to fit into a kind of, you know, have a historical, uh, have a history behind them. Uh, so if they have a history, then they also have a future, I guess. But, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's of course, it's, um, just my guess, <laughs> nothing more. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot for predicting the future, just <laughs> thinking about, you know, some of the ideological uh, frameworks. I mean, neoliberalism mm -hmm. and the fact that some, I mean, there's a strong utilitarian aspect to, mm -hmm. to it. And if mm -hmm. we are heading in a new direction, we could also think that the migration governance might head into a new direction yes, uh, yes, yes. along with that. So I was just, uh, you know, pushing you a little bit to think in a direction. Thanks a lot. No, but you're right. Yeah. Thank you much. Uh, thank you very much for all your questions. And thank you, Professor Peku, for this uh, very insightful presentation. Uh, I'm uh, looking forward to welcoming perhaps everyone in our next um, seminar. It's not going to be a migration seminar series, but it's rather going to be a training for interviewing vulnerable um, participants um, if you're conducting research. So vulnerable participants online uh, now with the COVID-19 restrictions. I will very soon be sending out details on the training and I'm still not sure if the training is going to be recorded or not. Uh, but anyway, thank you very much again, and very soon you're going to find the, um, the presentation, the seminar today online on, on our YouTube channel. If you have any difficulties in finding the link, please feel free to email me or send me a message on LinkedIn, and I'll be very happy to share it with you. Thank you very much again for uh, your participation, and I'm looking forward to perhaps welcome, welcoming you in our next seminar. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm.